the regularly scheduled meeting, Board of Fire Commissioners. It's Tuesday, August 21st, and it's about 9.02 a.m. Let the record reflect Commissioners Ibarra, Hara, Nimberg, and Woodsquare are present, and we have a quorum, Madam President. Great. Flaxley and Lisa. So we start with Commissioner comments. Uh, so on August the 12th, I guess it was, um, uh, Chief Lego and uh, retired Chief um, Yamahata and I were on the uh, bandwagon for the Nisei Week Parade in uh, Little Tokyo which uh, actually for me was very appropriate because I am a Nisei. I'm a second generation Japanese American. So uh, it was a nice event. And, and if, you know, a lot of the parades is really great because the crowds really, they appreciate the fire department and everything that you all do. So, um, you know, so I get to receive all the credit for <laughs> all the great work that, uh, that you regularly accomplish. morning um, I just want to uh, send my condolences to the families of the lost firefighters who are fighting the fires in California and actually internationally we're in unprecedented times and I want to thank you all and I want to thank the department for supporting the efforts and um, yes thank you all your courage and tenacity are saving lives, so thank you for putting yourselves in harm's danger, in harm's way. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so moving to report of fire chief. Thank you, Madam President. On August seventh through the eleventh, uh, I was I took a little field trip. I went to the Houston Fire Department to look at their telemedicine program. Uh, myself and our medical director, Dr. Eckstein. Uh, I think that uh, what they're doing is very innovative, and we're going to uh, pilot something like that before the end of this fiscal year. We have all the parts. We just need to make the connections. Following that, I went to Dallas, and they had the International Association of Fire Chiefs annual conference. Uh, learned a lot about firefighter safety and some, some things I want to bring back and provide training to our firefighters. The most significant presentation was from the UL uh, Laboratories Research Institute, and that presentation was the top 20 tactical considerations for firefighters. I think if our people know why we do things, that adds to their safety when they do it. So we're looking forward to that. On August 14th, I joined uh, Police Chief Mike Moore and the new uh, LAUSD School Super Superintendent Austin Butner for the first day of school at Wilson High School. Wilson High School is unique in that it has two magnet programs, the LAPD magnet and the LAFD magnet. Uh, four years ago, we didn't have any magnets. Now we have four. LAPD has five. So my goal is six. You have one more than LAPD. Um, uh, Superintendent Butner is going to help us. He wants to have 14. And I said, well, well, slow down. Let's make sure these are going good, and, and they are. Well, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about that. And then lastly, I was very honored to attend the retirement luncheon of Ms. Leslie Parada, a 33-year um, employee, civilian employee of our department who's been um, amazing to us in replacing all our computers and making software changes. and. and Sad to see her go, but there was a large uh, group of people there at Metro who wished her well and um, a happy, long, and healthy retirement. That concludes my report. Thank you. Uh, so now we have a verbal report by the Department on Significant Incidents from August 7th to August 20th. Good morning, Madam President, members of the Fire Commission, Chief DeRozas. Attorney Raffish, and to the management and staff 
of the LAFD. My name is Armando Hogan, Deputy Chief in Charge of Operations West Bureau. My purpose here today is to share with you a significant incident that recently took place in West Bureau. On Friday, August 17, 2018, at roughly 1936 hours, Operations West Bureau Resources responded to 2850 Riverside Drive in the Silver Lake area of Hollywood on a reported structure fire. This was incident number 1475. The first responding units found approximately a three-story over-parking apartment building doing business as the River Glen Apartments with smoke and fire showing from the third floor, which was later determined to be apartment 308. As our resources were en route, our Metro Communications notified our members of a possible patient that may be trapped inside the unit. Once on scene, our members encountered pack rat conditions in the unit. Based on the tremendous efforts of our firefighters, the fire was held to the unit of origin. The excessive storage in the unit made it, dif it, made it a difficult firefight, excuse me. However, a knockdown was declared at 1951 hours. This was only 14 minutes from the initial dispatch. A search of the apartment was conducted, and that search was completed when a body was found in the bedroom and lying still on the bed. It is with great sadness that I must report that the body found was that of a 90-year-old female who perished during the fire. After some discussion with the patient's daughter, who later arrived on scene, it was learned that the deceased suffered from multiple medical problems and was unable to exit the bedroom. Our LAFD arson investigators were notified and arrived on scene to assist with fire cause determination. As of my last discussion with our investigators, the cause is still undetermined. Additionally, the Mayor's Crisis Response Team was notified, as well as Council District 4, Council Member Rue, LAPD Detectives, Red Cross, and the Mayor's staff. There were no firefighters injured during this incident. However, we send our deepest sympathies to the family for their tragic loss of a loved one. I'll take any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now we have verbal report by the medical director. Same time period, August 7th, August 20th. Good morning, Commissioners, Fire Chief, City Attorney, Dr. Mark Eckstein, Medical Director. It's my uh, pleasure to present some significant EMS incidents since the last uh, Fire Commission meeting on August the 7th. Uh, these are all positive cases, good news, and great work by our members. On uh, August the 7th, Incident 298, Engine 472 and Rescue 105 responded to a, a person down, uh, suspected cardiac arrest. Our uh, dispatcher did an outstanding job in using tier dispatch system to process the call in approximately 45 seconds, providing dispatcher-assisted CPR. And the, our members found a 38-year-old male uh, with a down, unresponsive, unconscious, pulseless, apneic with CPR in progress, compression-only CPR by his wife. Uh, two young daughters also home at the time. Due to the uh, combined efforts and strong chain of survival, the efforts of our uh, dispatch system, ALS and BLS in the field, uh, the patient did obtain a return of spontaneous circulation and was transported to West Hills, which is a semi-receiving center. Uh, the patient got definitive care, had an internal defibrillator placed, uh, subsequently was discharged home neurologically intact to be reunited with his wife, who's a nurse, and his two school-aged daughters. So truly a, a tremendous save. It also underscores the fact that uh, the system we built for cardiac arrest victims can impact uh, patients of any age. On August the 10th, incident one, uh, 1555 down the harbor, Engine 48, Rescue 101, responded to a 66-year-old male, also a pulseless and apneic. Uh, again, dispatch was accomplished in under 60 seconds. Dispatch-assisted CPR, which is compressions only, was provided. And due to the efforts of our uh, EMTs and uh, paramedics, again, uh, return of spontaneous circulation was achieved in the field. Patient was transported to Harbor UCLA STEMI Receiving Center, and the patient was actually awake, alert, and uh, moving uh, prior, upon his transfer of care at the emergency department, and was uh, subsequently discharged after being transferred to Cedars, also neurologically intact with no deficits. On August 14th, in the 87th first in incident 541, uh, members were responded to an incident and uh, found uh, what was later turned out to be an illegal board and care facility with approximately 35 uh, adults residing there with a variety of uh, medical as well as social issues. Uh, there was a multi-agency response, including the dispatch of our new advanced provider response unit, uh, number seven, uh, located in the Panorama City area. And uh, 
The situation was mitigated, including the efforts of the APRU team, which treated and assessed uh, dozens of patients, uh, resulting only in a transport of four of the patients, and some of the patients actually were, not, were treated and released by refilling prescriptions on scene. So uh, very um, good use of a new resource by the, on the incident commander, minimizing uh, the toll on tying up uh, scarce ambulances in the San Fernando Valley. And finally, we had a, a great save uh, yesterday uh, afternoon uh, in 25's first in, incident uh, 1072. A uh, two-year-old female uh, was pulled out of the pool by her father. Uh, again, uh, dispatch was accomplished in 48 seconds uh, as an immediate dispatch for a drowning suspected cardiac arrest. Dispatch assisted CPR, which for an infant includes mouth-to-mouth uh, -mouth as well as chest compressions. Upon arrival of our uh, resources in 25, uh, the patient was uh, starting to breathe but had, uh, was limp and cyanotic, and our, our members did an outstanding job to resuscitate this uh, infant. She was transported to County USC Medical Center and is expected to make a, a full recovery. So I'm um, very happy to present some of these outstanding saves of uh, patients of a wide uh, disparity of age, which shows that we, we've created a very robust chain of survival, uh, starting with uh, recognition by our uh, uh, bystanders in the field, a strong dispatch system using TDS, uh, ALS and BLS and definitive care, resulting in some outstanding saves since our last meeting. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, so now we have, uh, I think we have two presentations. Good morning, Commissioners, Fire Chief Terrazas, City Attorney, Ms. Iniguez, Eric Scott, Fire Captain, Paramedic, and Public Information Officer. Uh, we are fortunate to have two um, presentations today, and the first person being recognized was critically instrumental in generating millions of dollars for our department. And so we would like to ask Fire Stat Manager Drew Steinberg to please stand near the, the podium. Mm -hmm. And she's being honored for her involvement in the Los Angeles Fire Department obtaining a $15.4 million federal grant that allowed us to fortify our resources at four busy fire stations. And she was critically instrumental in that. And so first we'll give a little background. In 2011, due to budgetary constraints, 11 engine companies and seven light forces were cut. That's a total of 270 firefighters. However, it had been Fire Chief Terrazas, as well as Mayor Garcetti and UFLAC's mission to restore our critically diminished personnel. So in an effort to do so, the department applied over a dozen times for this grant. It's a Staffing for Adequate Fire and Emergency Response, or known as the SAFER grant. Uh, it's awarded by FEMA. However, each of those dozen times to no avail. That is until we unleashed Drew Steinberg on them. Now, she spearheaded this effort, utilized resources available through FireStat. She collaborated with IAFF and UFLAC, along with compiling an accurate statistical analysis of our department's needs, all to generate a superior grant. And the awarded $15 million then allowed us to hire critically needed additional recruit, recruit class in 2018. And that recruit class then created the additional personnel that was necessary to staff those four new fire engines. And those went into service in uh, July of 2018. We went to Echo Park at uh, Fire Station 20, Lincoln Hearts at Station 1, Reseda at 73, and Mission Hills at 75s. So we thank you, Drew, for jumping in with both feet when asked to write this important grant. And because of your initiative, the LEFD received the largest SAFER grant in the nation in 2017. Chief Everett. I liked uh, what Captain Scott had to say. We unleashed Drew Steinberg <laughs> on FEMA. And, uh, you know, those that know Drew know what that means. She's smart. She's tenacious. She worked closely with myself and 
uh, IAF uh, F 10th District Vice President Lima, uh, UFLAC President Gamboa, the mayor's office, and it's not only it's, it's not like a one-page application. It's a thick, thick packet, and once you submit it, uh, you don't hear for several weeks, and if you hear nothing, you didn't get it. So, but when they start asking questions about uh, clarification on data. We were engaged to that whole process, and Drew was on point. We had meetings uh, regularly, and at one point she was on maternity leave. Remember that, Drew? Yes, We'd had conference calls. She probably does. And uh, I, said, I know you're having a baby, but <laughs> I got some questions, and she had all the answers. So I was so happy when we made that announcement at Dodger Stadium in July. We had the four engines with the backdrop, four brand new Pierce engines. So happy to see Drew and Firestat there so they could see what the efforts led to. Um, and after that, uh, we wanted to do something special for Drew, and that's what we're doing here today. Uh, we have, in addition to our normal certificate, we do have uh, floral arrangement. I'll let Chief Everett share the significance of that and let him say a few words. So Chief Everett. Thank you, sir. Uh, Drew and I go back to when I started as the Chief of Staff. She worked in the Mayor's Office and uh, she was our contact with the uh, Mayor's Office of Public Safety. So she's been in and around the department even prior to that as an intern and then and then we were fortunate to get her here as our fire staff manager. The roses that Drew has, there's 15 roses, they're all worth a million dollars <laughs> each. So each rose represents a uh, million dollars that she brought to the department. So we're just going to keep adding to that as she continues on next year's grant. <laughs> and uh, we'll have to get a bigger box. But um, I'd like to have Drew say a few words. I, I do want to recognize, too, I, uh, I wasn't able to keep it a secret from her that she would be here. However... We were able to keep it a secret from her that her husband would be here. So Jesse Aguayo is with us today, and uh, and that part was a surprise for her. So, without further ado, uh, Drew, would you like to say a few words? Good. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for um, the recognition. It was really a great team effort. I can't take credit for everything. Um, I don't know, I can't thank everybody enough. I'm glad the department was able to be successful in this grant. I hope that we're successful with this upcoming grant that we we're pending on and for future ones as well. So thanks, everyone. We have a second presentation. We do. The second presentation is an excellent example of humanity by one of our firefighter paramedics who displayed exceptional character, humility, and provided care beyond the call of duty. At this point, we'd like to ask the members of Fire Station 10 to please join us near the podium. Now, the incident took place on March 26, 2018. Rescue 10 was dispatched to a reported fall at the Expo Line platform on 23rd and Flower Street. And the victim was an 18-year-old male that was a special needs patient. He had been assaulted by some unknown individuals 
They then also stole his bicycle and then threw the patient onto the light rail tracks. Now, firefighter paramedic Jack Alpert professionally and compassionately cared for the patient. And then during transport, he recognized that the patient was very upset and disconcerted over the fact that his bicycle had been taken. So after transporting to a local hospital, Mr. Albert was deeply concerned by the unjust incident and decided on his own that he would attempt to replace the bicycle. So Rescue 10 drove to a local bike shop where they purchased a new bicycle and then drove back to the hospital and presented it. You could imagine the impact that had. Upon return to quarters, though, neither firefighter paramedic Albert nor his partner mentioned anything about this incident. The only reason we know of this story was about a month later, the patient's mother came by Fire Station 10 and wanted to know the names of the members that treated her son so professionally and even purchased a new bicycle. She informed the Fire Station members that her son was a special needs patient and was deeply touched by the treatment that he had received. So subsequently, Station Commander Eric Thompson wrote a detailed letter through channels uh, outlining Mr. Albert's admirable actions. And so firefighter paramedic Albert was not only modest and humble in never mentioning the events of that day, his actions truly represent our core values, particularly of service, professionalism, and integrity. Well done. Like I told the group uh, at the beginning of our meeting, I have uh, the great honor to represent the men and women of our department. And they do things like this every day. And they don't like to be uh, singled out. They don't like the attention. Jack's probably sweating coming to the podium right behind me. <laughs> but I think it's important that we highlight the special things that our people do. We have people up north fighting the Mendocino fire. Last year, we sent people to Houston. And we buy new bikes when we don't have to. I think that shows the character of Jack, uh, the heart that he has. And it's not the first time that I've heard stories like this. But I, I want to take the time to recognize them to praise them, to let them know what right looks like when we can make a difference in somebody's life. It may not seem like a big deal, but the rewards are tremendous. So Jack, here's your moment. I'm gonna give you the mic. Congratulations, I'm very proud of you. Thank you, sir. I uh, just want to say thank you for the recognition and thank you for my crew and my family for supporting me. Thank you. Great. Thank you.
Oh, she doesn't want to do it today? Okay, I'll do it. Um, okay. Okay. So let's do consent agenda items. Move to accept and receive and file items 4A, 4B, 4C, and 4D, and to uh, approve the recommendations and accept the uh, donation um, for um, uh, item 4E. Second. Oh. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So, Madam President, I'd just like to make a comment. Sure. I didn't want to pull to make a comment. On C, I really appreciate the personnel departments uh, following through on, on the request to uh, list the drop program by uh, various categories. And I appreciate I, it was very helpful in reading to see who actually is leaving the department and who's not. Uh -huh. And so I just wanted to thank them for their work on that area. Great, thank you. You don't want to call it special though, right? So you're okay moving it? I beg your pardon? Oh, oh no, we, we already voted yeah, on that. I just wanted to make a comment. Just wanted to clarify. All right, so regular agenda items, uh, 5A, uh, we have a request from the independent assessor to continue that because there's some issues that uh, we want to clarify. So let's do that. Uh, and then we go directly then to 5B, which is the report by the department on the policy for access to department files by the Office of the Independent Assessor. Good morning, Madam. President, Commissioners, Chief Terrazas, Julie and Isela, Deputy Chief Graham Everett, I'm the Chief of Staff. Uh, before you today is a report, a request by the department to um, provide access for the independent assessor for our disciplinary files. As you may or may not remember, in July, uh, the board voted to approve the template settlement agreements. Within that uh, settlement agreement template, there's a statement that allows the independent assessor to have access to review the settlement agreement. To get to a settlement agreement requires an investigative report and a disciplinary file. So the department is finding a gap in that policy in that we redact that information, but yet we don't redact the settlement agreement. So what we're asking for today is a little uh, consistency in that policy, and uh, I'll read uh, exactly what we're requesting. Um, uh, upon request by the uh, Office of Independent Assessor, the department will provide unfettered access to all disciplinary files, including all documents related to disciplinary investigative reports and uh, complaint tracking system and disciplinary tracking system. Upon the, re by request of the Independent Assessor, the department will continue to provide uh, the Office of uh, Independent Assessor with access to redacted copies of personnel files that are unrelated to disciplinary files. We just want to um, provide consistency in our um, releasing of disciplinary files. So that's before you today. Okay. And uh, your specific proposal is what? Can you describe it? Uh, so we'd like, oh, do you want to go to? You know, so we'd like the board to vote on whether or not we can provide the independent assessor unfettered access to disciplinary investigative files as it, um, as it relates to, as it as it is a nexus to the settlement agreements that we've already voted on is approved. So we just want that consistency and that transparency on the investigative report side as well. Uh, that's correct. In, in the second paragraph, it, it states our suggested policy. Um, we did receive a letter from UFLAC yesterday uh, highlighting their concerns. And uh, that's before you, uh, the board today to discuss this to, if appropriate, to vote on it and to uh, bring some consistency to that process. Okay. Well, uh, going back to settlement agreements, I think that we approved the settlement template in July, but we actually gave direction to the department to develop the settlement template a year ago. So we're actually talking about a long time frame. Correct. We've been sort of moving in this direction of providing the independent assessor with access to disciplinary files. So it happened over a year ago, and then it's been kind of a piecemeal thing. Um, I think for the Office of Independent Assessor, like the key, my understanding of the key part of why it was created 
was to um, was to sort of bring consistency in the disciplinary process so that people could know that you know you're not being treated unfairly if you're African American versus if you're the son of a battalion chief, let's say, you know, and, and that was the perception at the time. So that's the most important thing that that office does. So. I mean, we knew that uh, UFLEC would oppose this. Uh, we knew that UFLEC would oppose it passionately. I think it was more passionately than we anticipated. Um, but I think we need to move forward with that for disciplinary files that would otherwise be personnel records, that are personnel records. So for that category of documents, I, I agree with uh, the fire chief's recommendation. I have a question. The files that we're talking about are only files that are related to a disciplinary action. That's right. That's what's at issue right now. So only those personnel files that are related to a disciplinary action, not all personnel files. Right. And I think, I mean, it's obvious why that's really important for that office, but if it's, if we're talking about Ralph Terrazas when he was a captain at 26 is, we don't need to know what his supervisors said about him. If there wasn't, it's not related to a disciplinary action. I think that most members in the department would have a really strong objection with people looking at their, dis at their personnel files if it's not, there's no correlation to discipline. Um, you know, there might be historical reasons, whatever, but um, right now, I think it's a step too far and I think that what the department is trying to do is, um, you know, there's very strong opinions about whether the independent assessor should have unfettered access to all personnel files, even, you know, Terrazas' uh, personnel file at 26s and, I don't know, 1990-something. Um, you know, whether she should have that much access or whether she should only have disciplinary or whether she should have no access, which I think is what UFLAC is saying no access whatsoever um, is kind of how I'm reading it. So we're sort of trying to come up with a middle ground, and I think it's a sensible one. And this access would be necessary to complete the template that we're designing, that the department's designing? Among other things, but it's mostly t in order for her to continue to do the audits, which is the most consistent part of her work, is doing audits of how the disciplinary system is working. Um, is it, you know, are we, are we being consistent? Are we applying uh, our standards fairly? That's basically what she's trying to get at. She has an auditory capacity. She doesn't have an investigative capacity. So that's the other reason why people think that she doesn't, she shouldn't have access to original documents. She should have access to redacted documents. Um, and that may or may not have been the intent uh, when this was established, it's not our role to determine that. I think, uh, you know, there's some legal issues that are presented here um, that will be sort of determined by, um, uh, by, this, by a city attorney. It's not our role to sort of decipher the legal arguments that are being made. Uh, but it is our role to state as a policy matter uh, where we think the department should go with this. And so this is a sensible middle ground, I think. I mean, it yeah, seems, the it confusion seems like it would be difficult for her to complete the audit without having the information. Right. Mm -hmm. So. Yes, ma'am. And it's only related to disciplinary actions. Only yes, ma'am. That's correct. On the, we're proposing that the independent assessor have access to redacted uh, copies of personnel files unrelated to disciplinary actions. So there's kind of two pieces to this. Piece one is access to disciplinary files. I think that one's a clear piece. Uh, the independent assessor was created to audit how the department administers discipline. And the original language supplied by the union in their letter, they cite the personnel department's report of 2008. 
saying that the report opined that the proposed oversight entity needed unfettered access to complaint and disciplinary tracking systems, databases, files, members, investigations, management, et cetera. That's part one, and it goes to your point earlier, Commissioner. The auditor needs the information to make uh, valued audits, because without that, you don't have enough specifics. The second piece in our recommendation has to do with redacted copies of, of personnel files unrelated to discipline. That one's not so clear. So I think uh, the board has a opportunity here to discuss perhaps we divide our recommendation for now because I think there's more clarity in the disciplinary file issue than there is on the personnel file issue. So that could be an option that uh, a vote uh, be had about access to disciplinary files only and then at a later date after we confer with the city attorney and labor we can see can we re reach a resolution to the personnel file access uh, the re I've the redacted copies um, for other uh, just for other uh, issues seems like something that probably should happen I don't if they because I don't see where the name and information on the file is important to the investigation. It's just, I don't, I, I don't think we're investigating the names as such, but it's the action that that person has taken. Is there any way that even that these files could be numbered or something so that they are, there's no, uh, the names are not there? Your point is true. It's not an investigation, it's an audit. The independent assessor does audits. So that an audit is, it occurs after the event happens. Uh, I agree with you. You don't need specificity to audit a system. You can look at a, a higher level uh, database in terms of numbers, gender, whatever the case may be without having the sp uh, specifics of names. And right now, um, our proposal for the personnel file is to redact all personal information so it's not available. But there, that issue is somewhat cloudy. That's why I suggest that the issue be divided, uh, one of being discipline files access and the other is personnel file access. Are you suggesting that we bifurcate them? I think that's an option for the board to consider. I would recommend that uh, that's what we do, but that ultimately is your de decision. And it sounds like you're very hesitant about um, the second part. But the redacting? The re so uh, as written right now, uh, the personnel records that are unrelated to disciplinary actions would be redacted. She would have redacted access to it. Well, actually, that's the way I think they should be because I don't think the names are are related to the action that we're investigating. Oh, and we're not investigating, that we're auditing. But <laughs> just to be clear, though, for the, uh, for the ones that are related to discipline, the disciplinary files, it would be unredacted. So that's what, uh, and that's what we were saying was the key part of it, was having access to that, to unredacted disciplinary files. And what, he's, what Chief Terrazas is suggesting is that we bifurcate uh, personnel files unrelated to discipline, so just regular personnel files from disciplinary files. So we haven't approved the redacted copies yet, that part of, the, of this particular recommendation. Um, I, I was under the impression we'd already, that was No, that's for settlement agreements. So, so the actual settlement agreement is unredacted, because Ross is just a template contract. So we had it, um, we had the a settlement agreement has a clause where the um, where the member who's entering into a settlement agreement agrees to have the independent assessor review the settlement agreement. So that's technically a disciplinary file, but it's also a contract with the department. Correct. So, but we were already sort of moving in that direction of giving her access to underlying documents for disciplinary files. So we've been moving in that direction for a while. And yeah, you're right that it's a similar discussion that we've had before in the commission. It comes up periodically. But this is, so this is if, you know, when there's no settlement agreements, but there's disciplinary actions, those would be unredacted. 
So that's kind of the key part of what, what we're considering today. So when there's no settlement agreement, because we've already decided for settlement agreements, she does have um, unredacted access. So I guess I'm not clear on what we're looking at when we're auditing, because I'm not even sure that the name is then necessary for the disciplinary file. If I'm just not clear on, on what, why the name is necessary. In either, either case then, now that you explain that. I'm sure that's true. Um, the audits that have been conducted uh, do not have personal information. Um, and from that, you can extrapolate uh, trends to ensure compliance that certain procedures are followed. You don't need personal information. You just need broader, a higher level of knowledge. I think to simplify this, there, there are two pieces of my recommendation. The first piece is access to disciplinary files, which is much clearer than access to personnel files. So I would recommend that uh, the board um, modify uh, this recommendation to vote on what's more clear, access to discipline files for the independent assessor. And then I think- Which would not include personnel files no, it, it would not. Okay. And then at a later date, after uh, conferring with the city attorney and the labor, uh, figure out is there a, a solution to access to the second part. The first part by itself is a significant step forward. It's going to uh, provide consistency to our department. It's going to allow us to provide information unredacted, which is time consuming and costly and uh, it'll get uh, the independent assessor the infor information she needs to um, fulfill her primary responsibility is to audit uh, the department's disciplinary actions. Mm. Well, not well, if it's just for discipline and it's not the total file, uh, but I could also see at a time where if the um, in audit revealed information whereby something it seems to be cleared up in another way that it may need to look more in depth at the files but I could support uh, just the disciplinary files yeah. but not the personnel files I'm, I'm sort of curious about your experience as a teacher because you guys have a very high level of protection I think that's why I'm very concerned about well, the name part because as a teacher we wouldn't we would not want our personnel files open for people to investigate or look at only certain people for certain if there was a reason a disciplinary action was being taken you had an attorney who would look at them or someone who's in the district had a high position in the district could look at them but not just anybody would be able to get a hold to them um, and we're not very open to people looking at our files uh, that's that's a and so the name part I guess I, it, that's why the name. There are a lot of reasons why when you look at names on people that it becomes an issue. And I know that everything is supposed to be confidential and closed, but there are always ways sometimes things get out. <laughs> and then it can be used again against people in other ways. That's happened in teaching before. And we that's been released uh, not knowingly to the person who was... Uh, uh, being considered for either position or had been disciplined, uh, but other people would end up learning of certain things. So I, I, that's why I think it's uh, per discipline actions, maybe that's okay to look at and to start to look at them, but for the personnel files, totally. Uh, I'm, I'm just not in support of, of us doing that. And actually, I'm still concerned that names are not that important. Okay. When we're looking at trying to see if there's a pattern of actions that are taking place. Right. Uh, but you said you But I would support the, the okay. chief's recommendation on the disciplinary action, and I still think that I'm not sure why it takes a long time or have problems with redacting the person, the information, but uh, uh, it's because I, before when someone was here, they said it was only like 10 files at one time. It, it wasn't that many files. It depends on the ask. Um, we're currently processing 
a request of the Indian Pen Assessor, which is a lot more than 10 files, and it requires you to, to look at multiple sources of inf information to ensure there's no specific uh, identification information. So that has taken a long time, and you can outsource redacting, but it's very expensive. So we've been able to handle it, but this proposal will go a long way towards providing our department a method of uh, consistently processing requests in the most efficient manner possible for discipline. And, and ma'am, if I may, uh, to those 10 files may include, each one of those files is an investigative case, which may include 10, 15 interviews, um, multiple uh, um, pages of, of um, a transcription of the interview process. So uh, the consistency it provides by not redacting it, as, as our staff members are redacting these things, uh, there could be uh, an item within that interview that's missed. Um, and so the consistency part and the efficiency part and the costly part, because we would have to ship a lot of that stuff out to get the transcriptions done, bring them back and redact them ourselves. So each one of those files represents multiple hours of work, not just the 10 files. It's, it's a case. So uh, before we vote, should we, uh, do you have any suggested way of fixing kind of that first sentence and take out the second sentence? So let's like, let's just redline it like that, like take out the second sentence. This is really written correctly. Right. Okay, so just to be clear, the sentence that we're proposing to adopt is upon request by the OIA, which is the Office of Independent Assessor, the department will provide unfettered access to all disciplinary files, including all documents related to the disciplinary investigative reports and complaint tracking system, disciplinary, disciplinary tracking system, CTS, CTS, period, and then strike the rest of it. Mm -hmm. okay. For further... Yeah, that's what it means, though. I mean, that's the that's the risk is that there is absolutely no policy right now about personnel files that are unrelated. So, if just to be clear, including all documents related, does not include total personnel files. No, I mean, the, if if we redline it like this, there's just no policy. You know, it's not. It's there isn't a policy. So, I don't know if there's another. I, I think for now you're, you're right. I think we still need to confer with the city attorney and labor to fine tune what that second piece looks like. But I think just getting the disciplinary file issue resolved is a big step forward. So, so was that a yes or a no on including all documents related to disciplinary investigative report does not include the personnel file? Well, except that disciplinary files are personnel files. But they're like a subset. So it's yes, but is it the total personnel file or just the part related to discipline? Because when you leave it open like that, to me it's open. And, yeah, you know, something that's not clearly defined could be, you don't know what it could mean. Our intent is How to focus on the subset of the discipline within the personnel file. We're only looking at discipline. And the other thing is when you we want to make sure it's clear because Suppose Chief DeRozas is not here, and we're not here. And what does the next person do? Well, that's the danger right now of taking off the second sentence, because the second sentence at least limits the access for the rest of the personnel files. Now there's just no, there's no policy statement about I, it. I, I don't know why we're taking off that, because uh, the redacted copies of personnel files, I, I, I personally like that sentence. OK. Um, Except the department says it's very difficult to redact <laughs> information, but. We're not worried about the, the labor associated with it. I think that uh, the legal points outlined in the UFLAC letter caused me concern about access to the all personnel files. I think the simplistic way to move forward is incrementally and incrementally address the subset of personnel files, which has to do with discipline only. Discipline only. Okay. 
So. Then I would support the uh, just discipline only. That's a, yeah. that's what I support, just discipline only. Um, and uh, I would agree. Let's leave out that part and bring it back. Uh, maybe the city attorney's office can help to uh, draft some language that would be more appropriate. And actually, uh, <laughs> I'll support that part. Okay, so just the first sentence, right? Yes. Okay. All right, so I guess we can have a vote. No? Oh, that's right. We have three. We need to have a motion. Two public comments. Oh, yeah, we're coming. Um, I'm sorry? It's, uh, it's on this item. Okay. So first up is Tony Gamboa from UFLAC. Good morning, Madam President, Chief Terrazas, and Honorable Board. I know you guys have had some discussion here, but I got to go on the record on a few things here. My name is Tony Gamboa, and I represent the United Firefighters of Los Angeles City Local 112. I'm here to speak about the request from the August 16th report from the fire chief to gain unfettered access to all disciplinary files, as well as access to redacted copies of personnel files unrelated to disciplinary actions. While, the, while UFLAC supports transparency and the work of the independent assessor, we strongly believe that the charter provides the independent assessor with authority to perform her duties without violating privacy rights. We transmitted a letter to the fire commission that outlines our legal position and recounts what we believe are the original intentions of the drafters of the charter. Unfettered access to our members' files will violate UFLAC members' constitutionally protected rights of privacy. These are the same rights that all workers in California enjoy and personnel should not be treated any differently. The drafters of the charter never intended the independent assessor to have unfettered access and the role was created to report directly to the commission to provide independent civilian oversight of the LAFD. The voters have never approved the provision of unfettered access to LAFD personnel files and for the commission to expand the scope now under these recommendations would pose potential risk to our members. UFLAC members have a reasonable expectation that their records will remain protected from disclosure or release without consent to an outside entity such as the independent assessor. If the commission approves the recommendations of the fire chief report, these actions would be in direct violation of the charter and of the constitutional rights of our members as well as all employees of the fire department. Thank you for your time and I would hope the fire commission would reconsider this action and protect over 3,300 members of the fire department. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up is uh, Freddie Escobar from UFLAC. Good morning, Chief Terrazin, President Barra, and Honorable Fire Commissioners. Freddie Escobar, Second Vice President of the United Firefighters of Los Angeles City, representing firefighters, paramedic, dispatchers, and inspectors for the City of Los Angeles Fire Department. I'd like this commission to take a few things into consideration as we discussed, as you guys were discussing earlier. Currently, the independent assessor has open access to all CTS files. Our position is for this uh, independent assessor to have access to closed files. To protect the purity of the process, the member, and, uh, and have the access in a redacted form. So UFLAC's position is we want the independent assessor to do her audit. There is no reason for her to have access in an unredacted form. So you may ask yourself, what is our concern? As, earlier, men as mentioned earlier this year, the position of the independent assessor has abused her authority that she currently has access to right now. And that's why we want a transparent and fair process that protects our members. Privacy acts that allows the independent accessor to do her job. We also ask this commission to look into the current CTS system. As of now, if you have access into the CTS process 
into the computer, everybody has access to all open files. So UFLAC's position is, yes, we want a transparent and fair process. We want the Indian Pester to have access to these files in a closed, once the, once the file is closed, and then also in, an un, in a redacted form. Thank you very much. Thank you. So um, I think we can vote. So all in favor of the amended, the proposed amended, um, oh. Can I ask a question before we vote? Sure. Uh, if it's not unfettered access, what would it be? Uh, are we talking <laughs> about are we talking about personnel files no or audience participation? Files? I'm sorry. I interpret that to mean without obstacles. You could take out the word unfettered. We'll provide access. It doesn't. Uh, to me, it doesn't make that much of a difference. It's the same. It's like a legal term. That's why a city attorney. Is. That's why I put unfettered because it's like a legal term, but it's like unrestricted, unrestrained, un a whole lot of uns. But there's nothing going to be left out, basically. Nothing would be left out, so everything would be open. Yeah. For discipline, discipline. Okay. Okay. So the motion again is. Does somebody so move? Yeah, so moved. Uh, a second? I'll second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. All right, so, uh, so that's 5B. We don't have any public comment, so we could adjourn. So motion to adjourn. I so move. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.